Hello, I'm Srija. I'm a senior research scientist at NASA Ames Research Center, contracted by Bayer Institute. Today I will present a project called DShield, funded by NASA's Earth Science Technology Office to develop an operation scheduling tool for agile spacecraft constellations to maximize science utility. DShield is motivated by multi-payload, multi-spacecraft constellation scheduling for spatiotemporally varying science observations. It builds on years of tech development in small spacecraft, spacecraft constellations, where each spacecraft has the ability to full body reorient, that is point in any direction at any given time with a little bit of notice, as well as scheduling autonomy on the ground or on board, such that we can maximize coverage of ground points for any given number of satellites. These satellites may even talk to each other using intersatellite links so that they can coordinate observations better. We have applied these concepts in part across several use cases like maximizing land coverage, coral tracking, cyclone tracking, and urban floods. And in these studies, we've seen that ground scheduling algorithms are able to improve the number of ground points seen by two and a half times compared to a fixed pointing approach where the satellite stares in a single direction. Moreover, onboard scheduling is able to improve ground scheduling performance even more by at least 7% um, in, in these circumstances. So DShield is the scalable framework of tools and methods that helps schedule payload operations of any constellation where multiple payload characteristics, spacecraft, ground network specifications are defined in this input here. The scheduler then optimizes for um, the output schedule, constrained by orbital mechanics, resources like power and data, subsystems like instruments and attitude control. It is informed by the science simulator here, which quantifies the value of observing a grid point at some given point in time with some instrument and some observation parameters. When the commanded schedule is executed, it is simulated to sample a natural phenomena, which can be anything like floods or clouds, whatever it is that we're interested in, almost like a space-time cookie cutter. And these samples then feed back to the science simulator to inform the value of the next observation. Now, the more autonomously and in real time we can run this loop, the more reactive our operations can be. We've applied these tools to urban floods as our first relevancy scenario, where we assumed five to 42 cities, it's a variable, flooded simultaneously over a six hour simulation period. The extent of flooding in each city was represented by a stream, by a stream gauge calibrated value function, which is a 3D matrix of lat long and value that varies over time. One snapshot in time is shown over here. You can see the watersheds on this plot. So we simulated a 24 satellite constellation with precipitation radars modeled after RainCube, which is a CubeSat mission run out of JPL, to observe these, uh, these flooding events. These satellites could measure rain because they had the rain radar, but they had to infer floods from those measurements and then act on that inference in a coordinated manner across the constellation. So they used DTN or delay tolerant networking to exchange information over intersatellite links for such coordination. We showed that low latencies in information exchange, thanks to DTN, enables the onboard scheduler to observe 7% more flood magnitude than the ground-based scheduler. And both of these implementations did 98% better than constellations that could not reorient and therefore had no agility. In our second relevancy scenario, we're looking at soil moisture. And our goal is to use a combination of space-borne radars, radiometers, reflectometers to make spatiotemporal measurements that will reduce global soil moisture uncertainty. Now, the traditional solution is to design a single or a constellation of instruments with varying sizes and altitudes to address spatiotemporal trade-offs of soil moisture um, among themselves. And they're listed over here, and the underscored conflicts with all of the others. And therefore, um, it's an optimization problem how to design these instruments. Specifically for soil moisture, the noise in any static retrieval is called sigma NEZ. It's a function of ancillary parameters like surface roughness and vegetation, and it gets better with more signal, that is more backscatter in lower altitudes. The second factor, which is speckle noise or KP, represents the information content. 
it gets better with more information. So by averaging many spatial pixels or even putting together multiple measurements over a short duration of time together. Now, if we have small pixels, that is high spatial resolution, it's great for speckle because it's more information, but not so good for sigma and EZ because you're not getting a lot of signal. Small pixels also mean that it takes much longer to cover the globe and understand what's going on elsewhere in the world and revisit the same spot over and over for dynamic understanding of changes. Specifically from the radar perspective, we benchmark against a mission called SMAP, um, which is Soil Moisture Active Passive Mission. Now SMAP uses conical scanning um, with the radar um, at a specific sigma, sigma NEZ, and it has an, a long track resolution of 450 meters and a temporal resolution of three days. So what we want to do is to fly a constellation of strip map SARS instead of conical SARS, which would map the sigma NEZ, which would match the sigma NEZ of SMAP, and we'd optimize spatial resolution to be at least 50 times more than SMAP. Now, obviously, this would come at the cost of temporal resolution, coverage, and revisit, and speckle, which we intend to address with more looks, making more measurements, and intelligent agility. Next slide. Okay, so since our goal is to make measurements that reduce spatiotemporal uncertainties, we consider four sources of variation. The first is soil type and vegetation and soil moisture is very, very sensitive to this. So we split up the whole globe into 16 IGPP classes and five super classes, and we use different models for each. As a second, soil moisture varies with season, weather, and solar conditions, which will be accounted for in our speckle noise model within the science simulator. On these plots here, you can see the time series of soil moisture content collected by in situ field sensors, and you see that there's lots of ups and downs over the course of the year. Even when we run our models for RCS predictions in the L and P band, you can see a lot of variation over the course of the year. And therefore, this needs to be accounted for in the models. As a third, soil moisture depends on precipitation. And to capture the effect of using this as a prior, we used forecasts from public databases, which we then map onto our nine kilometer grid. Finally, as a fourth, soil moisture uncertainty is a function of how saturated the soil already is. So if it already has a, a lot of water and can't take any more, then signatures will not change much, even if there is rain. So for this prior, we use a SMAP saturated pixel product globally available every three days. Now I'm skipping the instrument design details here, but let's assume we have that, that one that maximizes information or radiometric content. So the next question is, how do we optimize for temporal sampling? On this figure on the right here, you see soil moisture changing in time, where every blob can be an integration of multiple measurements in order to reduce speckle over some delta t. And we can make measure, such measurement blobs more frequently when soil moisture changes quickly, example, when it's raining, and less frequently when it's more stable. Inverse modeling analysis showed us that an appropriate delta t is about two hours. And for every integrated blob here, soil moisture retrieval is then a function of what instruments we measured it with, what incidence angles we measured at, how many observations, and so on. To capture this, we made a table of combinations in which all these variables can be changed. And we see that with just two satellites, two instruments, two bands each, L and P, and three angles over a delta T of two hours, this table has more than a thousand rows. This is because we're allowing for L and P bands to be turned on and off independently so that we can conserve power if certain measurements aren't very useful. So putting all of that together in the concept of operations, we combine the combinatoric table with the ranked sources of soil moisture uncertainty. That is, is the soil saturated? Has it rained? Has that point been seen before? And at any time step, in the spacecraft operations timeline, the autonomy assimilates previous data, issues forecasts for the next planning horizon, quantifies observation value as a function of soil moisture uncertainty and the error tables I talked about, and then starts scheduling. When the planner finishes scheduling, it can the, the schedule can then be executed in the next planning horizon, and this whole process repeats indefinitely. This slide shows how the planner combines all the aspects I talked about in order, to in order to decide what to look at, when to look at it, and how to look at it. 
so it then has to choose an instrument, a viewing angle, for all available viewing times. The planner takes into account orbital mechanics, payload inputs, spacecraft inputs, and slew table constraints, as you see over here. And then it accounts for the science value ranks and error tables to issue commands and make observations in this loop here. We've put together a demo for this presentation where the search space is a 24 hour simulation broken up into four sections of six hours each. Um, the reason we, we chose six hours is because it represents the maximum duration of time between a spacecraft ground contact in currently available commercial spacecraft constellations. So you definitely get commands within that, and that's what we're trying to beat. On each spacecraft, we assume two instruments, L and P band radars. At any given point, the spacecraft can point in any one of 62 viewing options, and we split up the globe into at least 1.6 million ground positions um, on, on the land surface area. We first pre-process um, all of the search space to flatten the choices and reduce the search space a lit, bit, little bit. And then we use the CSP algorithm to find a solution. At every time step here, for example, you see that the planner has a choice between L and P band radar and which viewing angle. At any one of these choices, it knows from orbital mechanics which ground points it can see and what is the science value associated with that observation. And science value is um, a basically a quantification of the many soil moisture variables I described earlier and the retrieval error. The planner uses three preliminary heuristics as of now, which you see listed here. Number one is maximum coverage, which maximizes the number of ground points seen, but doesn't really use science value. The second maximizes the science value, but doesn't account for ground points. And the third one accounts for both. So it's a product of the ground point seen and the science value. You can see here that for one satellite over six hours, if we maximize coverage, we see more number of ground points, that is 18,000 versus 15,500. But we also have the largest slice of low science values. Red is bad, blue is good. Instead, if we maximize science value and GP, what we see is we don't see the maximum GPs, but we see the lowest sliver of um, crappy ground points. There's other heuristics, which I won't discuss now. This long video here shows the results of the planner using GP with science value maximization as the heuristic. You can see that the planner is selecting different pointing directions to point at, and therefore you can see the, um, the, the ground points being seen over here getting colored up, and it's moving a bit because it's selecting interesting ground points, things that are not frozen, where there's been a lot of rain, where there is no ground saturation. The colors indicate that it's a good science measurement or not. Green indicates good, yellow is okay, and red indicates bad, just like the previous slide. And you can see that in most cases, the planner ends up picking up ground points that are of maximum science value, therefore green. It, um, you can also see in this video that um, when, the, when the spacecraft flies over the oceans, it has the opportunity to swap, to move from one direction to another of pointing, and it use that, uses that time to slew between the two directions. So overall, among the 1.6 million ground points, we found that there were around 300,000 rainy unsaturated GPs, out of which about 5% of them were seen which means that although the planner is able to see only 3% of the, of the total number of ground points it's supposed to see, it's able to see 5% of the interesting ones. And this is really important because this preliminary planner shows us that the single satellite, this is just one satellite, a single satellite um, is able to achieve 15% of SMAP's temporal coverage at 60x the spatial resolution. So with that, um, I will uh, open up the floor for questions and also say that um, what I have presented today is just uh, a, a simple prototype with a single satellite uh, that's able to achieve 15%. Um, if we add more satellites to the constellation, two or three, um, we are very confident that we can get up to the, te uh, to the temporal resolution that current instruments are capable of doing or at least see the more interesting observations compared to the ones which are would be more wasteful of the radar power. Um, our source code and documents are publicly available on GitHub, and I'd invite you to download them and take a look. Thank you.